Good morning. <laughs> um, I'd like to talk to you today about the value of information architecture uh, and how uh, this value becomes actionable even in the most complex information environments, um, as well as uh, challenging uh, user interface scenarios. This will culminate into an information architecture maturity model uh, that gives guidance for pursuing information architecture uh, in digital, digital organizations. So you might not be convinced of this yet, uh, but the information architecture has uh, unharnessed potential. Um, and I'd like to give you three re reasons why. The first reason is that information architecture as a practice and as a discipline uh, is still uh, very young and it's in its infancy. Uh, even though we've been doing this for 20 years, there's still a great deal of work that needs to be done to solidify uh, best practices and a uh, shared understanding of what we do. In addition to that, and what contributes to this is the fact that there's also uh, a large effort of work that still needs to be done in theory, science of this field, as well as uh, research. What I'd like to talk to you today uh, is the primary reason for me, which is that information architecture's potential is, is due mainly to the fact that we need to help reset expectations about what information architecture is uh, and its contributions to the teams that we work on. Over my career, I've worked in organ organizations of, uh, many si of all sizes, basically. And in the last 10 years, I've been working in the, uh, the enterprise environment. And I've explained information architecture to many people. However, despite um, my efforts, it's been a challenge to move beyond the very popular and compelling view that, um, is cur that currently defines uh, this field. In the formative years of information architecture, um, late 90s, early 2000s, uh, information architecture uh, was, uh, became synonymous with organization, navigation, labeling, and search. Um, and thanks to Lou Rosenfeld and Peter Morville, uh, this was central to cementing the idea or, or cementing this idea in the technology community at the time that was struggling. Um, and this led to a boon in the practice and was uh, definitely a missing piece to uh, the ever expanding puzzle, which is human computer interaction. <laughs> now, the problem with this list, okay, uh, is that it became the, each topic that you see, organization, navigation, labeling, search, they became dis uh, associated and disconnected from the system that Morville and Rosenfeld were talking about. Uh, Morville and Rosenfeld said that in their book, and it's ever from the very first edition to the fourth edition, is they were talking about organization systems, navigation systems, labeling systems, search systems, a much broader set. And because the concept of system um, was inadvertently suppressed uh, for simplicity, um, and for good reason, I guess, it just, it, 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 um, it just took on, most organizations today now fall short in their ability to anticipate uh, the complexity of their own information ecologies. But this is where, in the system, this is where you'll find the true value proposition of information architecture. So I'd like to talk to you today um, and go over two value propositions, four modeling activities, and six pillars of user interface structure. So let's talk about the value, first two value propositions. Information architecture seeks to understand the environmental factors um, that impact a strategy and the use of a user interface. As you can see, the first three uh, presentations today are talking about this. You know, uh, not even talking about the interface, but just talking about the environmental aspect the, um, of what we're trying, of what you're trying to do um, with an interface or, or or a particular space. And because of this, this means that the interest of information architecture practice. Um, is how we potentially um, 
for how, how potentially many things can uh, help in the realization of a single use case or interrelated use cases. So not looking at just um, one thing, we're looking at many things. And so this means that information architecture um, uh, brings uh, to the table a systemic view about a project. This typically leads to uh, the second um, and most important proposition. This leads to the um, revealing flows and content and the properties that this content should have. Uh, and when relationships are, when we map these relationships of these many things, even down to the minute details, this is where structure in the user interface becomes tangible. Uh, and as a result, this is also where information architecture becomes tangible. So we're looking at the things and the space in between the things. And so to sum it, we're looking at systems of objects. We're looking at the structure of those objects within that system. And we're doing this because there's a lot of people who want to use a lot of different devices and need to get access to information. Uh, in many different ways. So this might still seem a little abstract, so I'm going to continue with this thought a little bit and um, talk about structure, because structure leads to information architecture's most tangible artifact. Um, so let's take a look at how we can contrast, um, or think about structure and, when, and contrasting it with design. So here we have a building, and we can all refer to this, uh, to this building as a, a user interface. Uh, if you wanted to demonstrate or appreciate the uh, architectural and aesthetic intent of this building, most likely you would say this is a pretty nice design, right? Um, when we refer to design in this way, the design is that which is engaging the senses, right? It's, it's what we see, it's what we touch. Rarely would you refer to this building and say this is a nice structure, right? Um, and that's because the majority of the structure is hidden. You don't always see the structure, uh, and because that, that's not the purpose of structure. The purpose of structure uh, is to support a design and, to, and the sustainable use of the environment. Uh, that's, and in a way, this is helping to provide resilience to environmental forces. So this building, well, I'll get, let me go to my next slide because I'm getting ahead of myself. So just to, I'll, I'll skip past this here, but this is basically kind of reinforcing what I just said. So, you know, structure supports the design and the sustainable use of an environment by providing resilience to informational forces. Now, so where's the structure? Well, here it is. This is the structure to, I mean, this is what structure might look like to buildings, correct? And as you can see, without this structure, you wouldn't be able to see a building. You wouldn't be able to see that pretty you know, uh, architecture that you, that you see. Um, but this is necessary. Um, now, structure isn't always hidden. Uh, in, in many cases, structure can extend to function as design. Right? And so this is an example of the uh, Denver International um, Airport, beautiful space. Uh, that I, I was able to uh, have to wait in security lines for, but this space is, um, it left an impression on me, um, but beyond the impression, um, what you're seeing is you're seeing a structure, but you're also seeing the design at the same time where they're sort of commingling. And uh, bridges are another great example of where structure kind of surfaces to, the, to uh, design. This is also where information architects get into the, the natural inclination to try to um, be more, uh, to help lead, um, or becomes easy for information architects to take on uh, a, a lead architect role because, as you can see, you're not also def trying to, in, in this particular case, the architect is, um, or it could be the information architect, is not trying to just provide structure but also trying to provide um, an experience with that. In this case, this is obviously a physical architect. So a, a design engineer, for example, um, if you're talking about buildings, um, are uh, individuals that kind of co-mingle architectural thinking uh, with the engineering and the physics that go along to make a design actually work. So if 
I were to sum up these two value propositions, um, is that uh, this lands us where we're claiming that information architecture is delivering a systemic perspective uh, for the purpose of a structurally sound user interface. All right. So this is somewhat, um, this, so this is the value, but it's still abstract. But now we're going to move into uh, making this more actionable. All right. How do we kind of make this real for um, the digital teams that we work with? Um, so I'll talk about four activities, uh, four modeling activities. So models basically uh, for you know my my mom or my sister my uh, my kids who might be watching this uh, <laughs> you might not know what models are right so models are basically used to reflect reality through abstraction and um, and so basically something relates to something else and models are very powerful uh, without these models without models we wouldn't have math we wouldn't have modern science we wouldn't have um, even the ability to to create buildings and bridges. Um, and you know we wouldn't have the internet, so they've been very useful in helping us to work through problems. And so, as information architects, these are types of we use many types of models to uh, help um, make sense of uh, the environments that we are trying to design for. So, the four specifically the four modeling activities that um, I'd like to kind of raise awareness to is the activity of helping to frame objectives. The idea of information architecture is not to frame the objective, but to facilitate in that framing of objectives. Um, but our responsibility is to model that, is to provide a record of that. Um, and when we do that, uh, that helps to bring coherence. Um, the next area of modeling activities is in synthesizing the research. Um, you can have an objective, but where is your objective coming from? And so this is a, uh, an input that is very important to information architects. Um, and when we synthesize that research, we don't necessarily have to do the research because there are practitioners who specialize in doing research. Our goal is to be able to look into that research and uh, discover the patterns that are helping us to, um, uh, again, to model what the research is saying so that we can connect it to the objectives eventually. And in this case, which is the third activity, which is when you have both the, the framing of objectives and the synthesis of research, um, this allows us to then have a conversation of aligning those two things together to, to ensure that moving forward is actually going to make sense uh, when we're talking about a user interface. This is a great way to also, when you're, you're bringing the client through in this, um, by the time you get to, uh, or you finish this third area of modeling and having conversations with a, a client, uh, everyone, is, everyone is on the same page and feel comfortable in moving forward. The last is the more detailed, more grani uh, granular um, areas of activity where you're modeling the, the relationships and the information because out of, that, that con out of the conversations of, of the users, you get the intent you get the task analysis and you get the flows uh, and you uh, understand what the needs are and you start modeling the information at that level. So those are the four. This is just a quick list that I use um, a lot to try to um, uh, give you the breadth of the types of models that you would use um, in, in, in this work. Um, as you move from uh, a junior to a senior practitioner in this, you'll likely come across every single one of these in some way or another. And in, even in more complex environments, you'll will be using this, these all the time, ideally. OK, so this leads us um, to what I call the six pillars of um, user interface structure. So, but before I do that, I want to um, you start with a simple model. Um, um, and this model begins with an environment. Um, you, you will hear that and see that in all of the uh, literature that is out there in this field. And so for us, we are dealing with a very uh, much larger space and a larger context. And, and so we acknowledge an environment. And in that, in that environment, that's where we find a particular user interface. Um, and with the reasoning and the logic that I'm going with right now, we're saying that 
structure is behind that user interface. Now, structure has to anchor um, to the user interface or to, to anchor structure. Um, the, the goal is to anchor it to a foundation, right? A strategic foundation. Um, and it does this by modeling the systemic relationships between the user interface, concepts, content, and data. And we, the goal is, mo these are the areas where we're looking to model. Um, because from a, any strategic or architectural intent, this is what we can derive and we can begin to model. Uh, so let's take a look at more specifically how we would uh, mo model user interface. Oh, and I'm sorry. One more point that I wanted to make here is that in the visually here, the idea of information architecture is to actually connect all those, right? So that's very, very important, um, and I almost missed that out, right? Um, it's not just modeling, but showing how all of those actually connect. All right, so now we're gonna look at those four. Um, and I'm gonna do this in, in sort of two pillars at a time. So in, in terms of the user interface, when we're trying to model, we're looking at content interaction, we're looking at information retrieval. These are things that are happening above the surface, uh, the tangible areas. And so this is where you see navigation, um, look, uh, the, the modeling of the navigation, the modeling of labeling, um, the modeling of relevant hierarchy, uh, and the organization of the content. And these are both, um, I'm calling these content interaction and information retrieval sort of pillars. Um, you then move into a little further down into the content itself um, in needs analysis. So we're modeling as well how people are trying to consume uh, information and content. And this is typically sort of the library science kind of, of realm and is also um, uh, the aspect of this field that a lot of people understand and get and, and this is where the focus is. However, the goal is um, what goes beyond library science is in the idea of creating the content. Library science is not, um, was never intended to create content but to facilitate the distribution of that knowledge and access. And so this is where the, um, we're crossing over into another uh, domain of information and science um, that still needs uh, development in our, in our field. And so here, um, and so this leads us to these other complex issues in terms of how we're modeling concepts. And these, when we're modeling concepts, concepts derive from our uh, research and discussions with users and, their, and um, we discover their perspective and behaviors. And how do we model perspective and behaviors, right? we can do that. Um, and uh, a very typical um, tool in the past has been um, personas. But from an information architect's perspective, uh, personas are typically a uh, sort of a dossier, right? And, and, but the idea is that the information architect's role and job is to actually take that and abstract that dossier. Um, and so, uh, and I can't get into specifics because I only have 30 minutes. Um, but we also get into culture and a situational analysis. And these are things that everyone's been talking about so far. But not just talking, about, but not just um, having conversations and or um, unearthing that research. The idea is to then model the culture. How do you model culture? How do you model situational analysis? Flows are ways of modeling, uh, modeling paths. Um, and then uh, connected with, with that, and they're all interconnected, um, is we get down to the, the most technical aspect of here is where we, we're looking at, as you do all of this in, uh, analysis on a particular environment, um, what are the things uh, that people are using um, and, and the, um, what are they using and how does it need to be used? So if it's content, um, it is how does that content turn into a content model, for example? Uh, and then how does that relate to the database uh, modeler that then has to consume that and to power a content management system? And so that is the full range uh, that um, uh, you can come to expect uh, because we touch the business 
and the, the product manager, whoever it might be, and we also touch all the way down to technology and their deliverables there. And their deliverables throughout all of this where content strategists are going to want to have access to, uh, user experience designers are going to want to have access to, interaction designers, UI designers, all the way through. Um, and so when we connect all of these, and so this essentially gives us our maturity model. Um, and so, and the idea here is that when uh, you are in an organization, um, maturity models typically move from left to right. And so it's going to be very common in your organization that you're going to be dealing with uh, right, uh, the, 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 um, the surface um, uh, modeling activities around content interaction, information retrieval. But your objective is to, uh, is to uh, mature your organization to model all the way to the, to the, the right side, where, they are, where it actually begins to force them to uh, document and consider all of the insights that they've gathered. Um, and it, this is also helps in the, the um, uh, within the, and this all aligns with the overall user experience process. Um, but pulling that, um, that UX design uh, process and, and uh, outputs when there's research that's done, but now converting that to real actionable models that can be referred to in the future for uh, further alignment. Now, um, so um, bringing this closer to a close, but uh, it's important to understand that information architecture also does not happen uh, in a vacuum. Uh, it's very important to remember. Uh, like I said before, there is a, um, a very large set of, uh, um, of practitioners and disciplines that kind of uh, feed into this. And that's why it's very important to understand the value that um, that information architecture has when you're bringing um, uh, uh, user experience strategists together, designers together of all walks, uh, developers, um, uh, and the business, when they confer converge, um, it's important in very, very complex environments to be able to understand what the true value is. And this is just an example of, this is a, an image of a UX design practice vertical that I came up with um, in uh, 2011, I guess. And um, this was something that I had produced uh, for myself as a practitioner to make sure that I understood and uh, was able to ground myself in how I sort of fit with the, the rest of the uh, uh, design community. Structure shouldn't just happen, right? It should be engineered. In 2012, McKinsey and company sponsored uh, a report that studied that 50, uh, studied 50 uh, 5,400 large-scale uh, IT projects, and they found that half of the projects uh, ran 45% over budget and delivered 56% less value. Basically, uh, paying more for a whole lot less. Um, now, part of these inefficiencies are due to, in my argument, um, unsound structure. Without structure, no one can account for how the user interface will sustain its purpose. And that's why in the digital domain, the model that information architects can produce, um, the model is the structure. It is the structure to the user interface. When we model the user interface and its structure, uh, we reduce waste, um, we uh, minimize iteration, um, we improve outcomes, and we can take uh, more ownership of the digital environments uh, that we create. This is where information architecture del delivers value. So I'll leave that with you. Two value propositions, four activities, uh, modeling activities, and six pillars of uh, UI structure, sort of a rubric. Um, that uh, you can actually kind of say that in a sentence and almost makes sense, you know. Two value propositions for modeling activities uh, across six pillars of UI structure. No, no, no. <laughs> uh, so, uh, I'd like to close with the hope that um, this presentation has offered a clearer picture uh, of information architecture's potential and the trajectory that information architecture can have in organizations. But there's still a lot to do. Because the, the, uh, the maturity um, model 
well, uh, let me I'll say it this way. The maturity, because of the maturity model that I showed, it's not just um, a maturity model for doing information architecture in organizations alone. It's actually a model for our entire industry. We still have a lot to close in terms of being able to uh, even understand the science uh, and the best practices for really connecting all of those dots all the way across. Um, and so we need individuals who are interested in the theory of the work that we do, the science of the work that we do, and the research of the work and the practice, because all that is sort of inter intertwined. Um, and this is important because history has shown that um, our information environments are going to become more complex. Um, and it won't be long before large institutions begin to experience um, the same, or it won't be, large institutions are going to experience yet newer um, information management challenges. And when that happens, we'll be dealing with the, the complexity that the corporations are dealing with, right? Uh, it just gets passed down to us. Um, and the fact is today that large organizations, um, their technology teams are struggling. Uh, with information interaction and knowledge management. Uh, and many are hedging their bets on artificial intelligence and data analytics, uh, deep learning, but these are only going to get us but so far. Okay, so if you choose to carry the torch for information architecture, remember this, that every user interface has structure. Uh, and to investigate the structure of a user interface, we must model its environment to bring coherence to the strategy uh, and the design. As we expand the popular view of information architecture, of information architecture practice, I am confident that information architecture will surely live up to uh, some previous aspirations uh, of becoming a viable and respected uh, profession in the 21st century. Thank you.